we are on live and we'll give folks a, a minute or two to join us and uh, meanwhile I'm setting up my my uh, screen so I can see what's going on both on uh, zoom and on YouTube okay um, <clears throat> All right, so today we're going to work with uh, Jung's Red Book for Our Time, Searching for Soul Under Postmodern Conditions, <clears throat> um, edited by Murray Stein and Thomas Arst. This is volume two. <clears throat> and uh, this series now has about 70 essays by Jungian analysts talking about the Red Book, either directly or indirectly. Um, and uh, today, uh, I'm going to read an essay by uh, Dr. David Tacey. Uh, Dr. Tacey is an Australian, and uh, the essay is entitled, The Tr Return of the Sacred in an Age of Terror. Um, and uh, there's a quote from Jung at the beginning of the essay, when an inner situation is not made conscious, <clears throat> it happens outside as fate. The world must perforce act out the conflict and be torn into opposing halves. Okay, so he talks about the sacred and um, I'm, uh, rather than do a stump the stars <laughs> with my panelist here, it's, it wouldn't be fair. Um, I'm going to, uh, here comes Joanne, good. Uh, this, um, ra rather than stump the stars on the definition of sacred, I'm going to read, I I'm going to have some comments about the sacred here uh, before I get into Tacey's uh, essay and you're welcome to comment on what I, what I say. Um, but um, we saw an eruption of the sacred at the U.S. Capitol on um, January the 6th. But long before that, uh, there were pressures that were building up in the U.S. environment. Um, and uh, I'm going to try to describe them uh, in various ways. Uh, and first of all, <clears throat> Let me mention that there's a theme in the movie Don Juan DeMarco. <clears throat> the name of the movie is called Don Juan DeMarco. And it is um, it's a lovely movie about a young man who's, who's uh, committed to a 10-day timeout at a mental institution. And uh, he sees himself as Don Juan. Um, but what he does is he turns the tables on the two uh, therapists, psychotherapists who are talking to him and he becomes their therapist. And uh, in the midst of this movie, he, asks, he says, there are only four questions that matter in the world. There are only four questions that matter in the world. What is sacred? of what is the spirit made, uh, what is worth living for, and what is worth dying for. And the answer to all four questions, I'll, say, I'll, I'll ask the four questions again, just in case you didn't pick up on it. What is sacred? What is, of what is the spirit made? What is worth living for? and what is worth dying for? And the answer to all four is the same, only for love. Um, and so, okay, we start to get into what the sacred is. Um, and this kind of, we have to sort of talk around it because it's so immense that, um, we can't really define it in any sure way. 
And um, one of the ways to describe it in the East is uh, by karma. Uh, and karma is, is the Eastern way of saying what we say in the West, what goes around comes around. In other words, um, if, if, you know, if you take somebody's eye, they're likely to come take your eye. Uh, if you, you take somebody's tooth, they're going to come take your tooth. And as uh, uh, Gandhi said, uh, an eye for an eye makes the whole world blind. And so we have to um, learn how to not build up these resentments, okay? And uh, last, I think it was last week, we were talking about Edinger's uh, letter to the editor of the LA Times that was, uh, that's an archetype of the apocalypse. And he said that terrorism is, a, is caused by deep-seated resentment. Um, and, and so anyway, um, you know, what comes to mind too, is even with the title congruence is the book, the sacred and the profane, which is a biography of Mozart and where Mozart is the sacred and Salieri is the profane and Salieri certainly has deep seated resentments. And that love piece is inclusive of, of the both and of the entirety of them. Sure. And uh, uh, it's all in the Eros and Logos, isn't it? Because right. um, Mozart had the Eros, he had where we live, but Salieri was also a very competent musician. And right. so he could put notes down on a page, but he couldn't put down on the page what's between the notes. Right. And, and that's, that was, that's the issue. And yeah, living in the interstice where the art comes from. Right. So, so first of all, before we get to terrorism per se, uh, I can give an example of how this comes up in my life because it's, it's Susan, uh, our, our panelist here today who uh, first talked to me about the idea of eruption uh, and the eruption of tremendous anger. And um, I have since that time, and that was, I don't know, most of a decade ago, I guess, um, I examined my own life and I'm trying to understand how eruption happens. And um, I remember when I, um, one time um, when I was a brand, brand newly minted second lieutenant in the Marine Corps. And so to my mind, I was an offer, officer and a gentleman by act of Congress. Uh, and what I didn't realize was, okay, but I hadn't offered the, or I hadn't uh, earned the gentleman aspect yet. <laughs> <laughs> it was just Congress has said, "Yep, you're an you're a gentleman now." <laughs> I'd earned the officer part, but not the gentleman part, maybe. And I remember going into a car dealership one time, and um, I wanted to buy a car, and the the uh, salesman said to me that he couldn't give me credit. I said, and I just blew up. Okay. And I know that this happened, happened to me in those days, maybe between age 20 and 35, I would say I, I had an explosion of fury, uh, perhaps uh, once a year, uh, once a year, something happened that just boom, set me off. And I would just scream at somebody. And so I was just screaming at this salesman because he wouldn't give me credit. And I said, wait a minute, I have an income um, and I'm an officer and a gentleman by act of Congress. And he said, yes, but there's the Soldiers and Sailors Relief Act. And I said, what the hell is that? And 
Uh, I, do, I didn't say it so genteelly, I must say. <laughs> <laughs> and and uh, it turns out that if you're uh, in the military, they cannot sue you uh, for under civil law uh, for a debt. And so, um, so in other words, if you don't pay, uh, they, they have no recourse, no legal recourse against you. And um, so one wonders how, <laughs> how young military officers buy cars, but nonetheless, we did uh, over time, but they wouldn't lend me the money for that car, I guess. I don't know. But anyway, I, I, I really don't know because I was so furious that they wouldn't give me credit um, when here I was, you know, brand new out of college, earned my commission, ready to go, new wife, needed a car, and, you know, they just blew me off, and I, I was furious, and so that, that's an eruption, I would say, and Susan can correct me if I'm wrong on that, but I think that's an eruption, and so all of us have gone through uh, those moments of fury uh, from time to time. We get angry with our spouse or uh, what have you. And uh, certainly um, when my first marriage fell apart, um, it mainly fell apart uh, because my wife and I uh, were young at the time and we had no training in psychology whatsoever. And so um, if we got in an argument about something, it would become, it would get out of hand and we would both be furious and uh, it finally got to the point where my eight-year-old daughter sent a note down our our spiraling staircase in our house and the note said please stop fighting uh, and I read that note and I realized that I couldn't stop because my wife kept pushing my buttons, my, my ex-wife. And, um, and the way she would do it was she would push my buttons on every disagreement we had had for 17 years. <laughs> and so every time there would be an argument, she started the beginning and work right through them all. And, and so the fury of all those times would get worse and worse and worse. And, um, and so when I married Debbie uh, 35 years ago, uh, I made a pact with her that if ever we disagreed, that uh, once it's over, we will never speak of it again. And uh, that has been a, a rule that I think works well in a marriage. Uh, you can't you can't just retrace all your old hurts uh, because if you do it, it ultimately becomes too burdensome and it, and it blows up the marriage. Um, you know, that's an excellent rule as well, because then it sets the tenor of respect, not even of each other, but of the argument so that if it is brought up, it's always brought up thoughtfully. So it's not really actually exhumed. You know, you're not digging in each other's dirt. You're going, you know, this, this applies to, and it gives you an opportunity, I think, for reflection rather than repetition. Well, and and we just can't mention it. We can't discuss it again. It can't be brought up, and and it works. Uh, it's it's a maturity thing, but it, it works in my experience anyway. And I'm I'm not a mental health professional. I think Susan is, and probably has had lots of uh, marriage counseling in her. Go ahead, Susan. Go. Uh, just what Jordan said, you know, a moment for reflection and thoughtfulness. But um, and just to add on to that, to say that, you know, what was that button, or what is that button that's being pressed? In other words, to look for that particular, you know, what what actually the hook of the complex is. That's all I wanted to say. I mean, you know, one can yeah. do that privately, reflectively later on, you know, just to ask, you know, what was it that sort of, you know, ruffled my feathers? 
and, yeah, I and then bring that, that up again between you and your spouse? How, how no, between, this... between you and it... yourself. I, I went through that with brain spotting where there was the, the eruption I would have, the trauma trigger, the trauma trigger that had been pressed. The person who was on the receiving end did not deserve the immensity of the scale of that. And what they just said there would in no way have precipitated that much emotion. So there is something that is, that is welling up. And what it is, is there's a template where you feel exactly like you felt when the trauma occurred. And the problem is the trauma is always fresh. It does not age. Yeah. So when it comes out, it's warmed up and it's right where it was. And what I found with the brain spotting was interesting because you stare at a certain spot until because your eyes the theory is your eyes lock on the trauma and burn that spot in the back of your brain basically and when you look at it and you feel the charge it opens the portal but it's not with the spouse it's with the self and what happens then is you realize that there's a place there for you to be able to say thank you to someone who pisses you off because internally you're like oh you let it go now I see. So in a sense, you're flushing out the predators, um, but then they end up becoming allies or they okay. integrate. So anyway, but that's, yeah. I think, between both what Susan and right. I were mentioning. Okay. So, so anyway, there's, there's something sacred in a marriage that you have to be sensitive to. After the honeymoon's over, um, you have to, you know, it's very important to have respect in a marriage and, and, um, you know, if, if you just let things build up as sooner or later they erupt. Okay. So now fast forward to January 6th and, um, and what, uh, Edinger said about resentment, um, you know, there's, there is a lot of resentment in the United States. There is resentment in me um, about things that have gone on in the United States over my lifetime. And what we saw on, um, on the 6th of January was a collective resentment uh, that, uh, you know, there with the exception of some people who are um, violent by nature and, and really um, mean this stuff. The, my sense of the people that were walking toward the Capitol that day is that a lot of them were, are sincere and uh, good Americans. I mean, they were carrying a symbol, the American flag. Um, they were carrying a, uh, one fellow had a, a Marine Corps hat on and, um, and he couldn't put his finger on what it is he was angry about, but he was definitely angry. And, uh, and, and none of them could. I mean, when, when the reporters during the day tried to talk to them about what they were so angry about, they were totally inarticulate about it. They couldn't, they couldn't speak about it. And, and so, uh, you know, they love their country, obviously. And so they're carrying the same symbols that I carry every day. Uh, <laughs> in, if not physically carrying a flag, at least I carry it in my heart. And, um, and, uh, and so, so there was an eruption of something that was very, um, well, sacred. I mean, the what is sacred about one's country um, is, you know, um, you believe certain things about your country, and if if that gets transgressed, um, then you're ready to fight about it. Okay. I mean, that's what happened in World War II. I mean, um, the U.S. wasn't ready to join the war and so the Europeans were fighting for two years before more than two years before the U.S. even entered World War II um, but ultimately there was a transgression not even in Europe but over in Hawaii 
against the United States, not even by the Nazis, but by the Japanese. And all of a sudden, okay, now we're ready. We're, now we're angry and now we're gonna go to war, not only in the Pacific, but also in Europe. Um, so something had been transgressed at that point. And, and that something is on the order of sacred. So if I may too, what my sense there too was, especially you bring up the point about the inability to, they, they were attempting to emote, but they could not speak any intelligible reason. And I just got the specific sense, especially with the, res the resentment, not of just loud and abusive households, people who grew up in a you know, family dysfunctional war, to be more general, it felt like I was watching the capital T tormentor, but the mentor tormentor, both and of the parents, was not present in, in, in such a way where they couldn't make a diamond out of their misfortune. They can only waste the trouble instead of going, oh, this is a problem. Well, yeah, they don't have a, they didn't have enough they don't have education like you have. You obviously, Jordan, in your lifetime have had a lot of guidance on psychological matters, and most people haven't. Okay? Right, most and that's it's it's ingrained. And I mean, if you if you right. what did Bruce Bruce Lee and most every other monk say? A water conforms to its cup. I mean, you, you swim in sewage. It doesn't matter how dispassionate you are; it gets in. I mean, so, so, okay, it's, so, anyway. so anyway, we're, we've addressed the sacred now. And so the essay, um, and if we have to talk about more, we can talk about more as we go through the essay. But so the name of the essay is The Return of the Sacred in an Age of Terror. Okay. And the, the quote of Jung before his essay begins is, when an inner situation is not made conscious, it happens outside as fate. The world must perforce act out the conflict and be torn into opposing halves. Okay. And, and so in the discussion we've just had, we saw how the opposing halves get torn apart. Okay. And the fate piece, you and I both there were it, it, the button pushed and it lives out here instead of from within. Right. Right. Okay. So here's what Tacey says now. Jung's Red Book throws much light on the situation of the sacred in postmodern times. When the sacred returns, <clears throat> uh, before I get into the next sentence, let, let me just talk about postmodern times, because this is a term that I was not familiar with until uh, this series came out, this series right here. And I said, you know, I always thought I was believing living in modern times. I didn't never thought about postmodern. Um, but modern times had a lot of boundaries. It had national boundaries. It had racial and ethnic uh, boundaries, etc. cetera. <clears throat> uh, but in postmodern times, those boundaries have been washed away. And uh, actually, um, my friend Thomas Arst gave a great definition of it, if I can find it here quickly. Well, um, and even while you're finding that, even in architecture, I mean, the modernism, postmodernism, and then they call the international style. And all it meant was white, undressed planes, no curves. I mean, it, so it, it's interesting how it's presented in different fields and how it's shown up in different ways uh, around that whole boundary removal concept. Yeah, and just, I can put my finger on it quickly. Um, we'll read it, otherwise we'll go on here. Um, okay. Basically, it's saying, okay, now, uh, instead of white Americans living next to you, you have uh, a Venezuelan American living next to you on one side and, uh, and uh, a butcher on the other side who has a Mercedes and, and so on. And, you know, in, in, in modern times, uh, people understood what the class structure was. But in 
in postmodern times, we no longer know. I give you an example. Um, you know, I always thought that if if only I worked hard and got my degrees and so on, uh, that the world would pay me back for that hard work. Uh, but then I ended up buying my home uh, from a man who <clears throat> spent his adulthood building homes and and living in them and then moving on and so he was basically a he wasn't even an, an official carpenter he was basically a handyman but he lived better than i did and his home was bigger than mine and he had better cars than i had and so on so um you know that boundary of class structure you know here here i am you know, a lawyer, blah, blah, blah. And, and here's this guy that basically could build houses. <laughs> and he didn't have to put in the years of education that I did to get where I was. And um, so that's what postmodern times is about. There are no boundaries anymore. Um, and uh, so anyway, I'll go back and read this sentence again. It was the first sentence in the essay. <laughs> Jung's Red Book throws much light on the situation of the sacred in postmodern times. <clears throat> when the sacred returns, it causes disruption to social and personal order. On January 20th, 1914, Jung's soul arises from the depths and asks him if he will accept war, destruction, and mayhem. His soul shows him images of military weapons, human remains, sunken ships, and destroyed states. Jung struggles to integrate these images and says he could not conceive the extent of what was to come. Quote, I felt the burden of the most terrible work of the times ahead, unquote. The soul would bring the unleashing of chaos and its power and the binding of chaos. Chief among the gifts of the soul will be the gift of religion. By religion, Jung does not mean membership of a church, but the attitude peculiar to a consciousness which has been changed by the experience of the numinosum. He means an encounter with the numinous in its most powerful and existential aspect. This gift, Jung reflects, is a kind, is still to come, but it will become evident. I sat up for long nights and looked ahead at what was to come, and I shuddered. Okay, and so, and so the event of January 6th was a numinous event in the sense that it was mysterious. How, why did all these people go and attack? their governmental leaders all of a sudden, and, and they couldn't really explain it, except they were part of this psychic epidemic that washed over them in the morning. And and so then everybody else was doing it, doing it. so I guess I'm doing it too, and I'm gonna go to the Capitol. They didn't have any clear idea of what it was that they were gonna do. And yes, it's true that if they had caught any of the legislators in the Capitol, uh, they might well have killed some of them um, if they had caught a, f a few in particular. Um, but that wasn't everybody that had that in mind. Most of them had in mind um, just doing a demonstration. They thought they were in a demonstration and you know, most of them were not armed. Um, and you know they just went and with their physical bodies forced themselves into the capital, and so it wasn't like they were had planned an attack. It wasn't a planned thing per se. And when they got into the Senate chamber and the House chamber, they didn't know what to do. They got in there and they had no thought about what to do, and they sort of idly. <laughs> you know, going thumbing through papers and so on, but they didn't destroy the papers. They left them in the desks and so on. They just looked at them and said, oh, okay, this must be, uh, what's his name's papers, but they, they didn't have anything to do with them. So, 
you know, um, that moment makes a wonderful visual metaphor metaphor of the destination is not as important as the journey. Yeah. Well, so so anyway, we, we saw a psychic epidemic mm -hmm. that literally spread through a large group. And uh, I think most Americans uh, recoiled at at what happened that day. I mean, first it was happening and we said, what, what the heck is going on, right? But, but most Americans would have recoiled at that and said, oh my God, <laughs> we, I wouldn't do that. But on the day, yes, you would have maybe, okay? Because on the day, if you were in that crowd and you were pushing down toward the Capitol, you didn't know what the, what the organizers, the people that did have mayhem in mind, um, we're going to do you're just walking and going with the crowd and then all of a sudden boom uh, we're in the capital and and people are dying but but the uh, but of the five that died four of them were demonstrators okay four of them were fat old men who had heart attacks uh, who who were in the crowd and had been pulled along and only one was a police officer and I don't think anybody intended, uh, well, I'm not saying anyone, but uh, because I don't know the actual circumstances of uh, that officer's death, but um, I don't think there was anybody in the, in the crowd, uh, let's say 95% of them that thought that there was gonna be any bloodshed that day. They thought that they were just gonna go in and demand um, something and, and uh, I don't think they specifically thought that anybody would be hurt. <laughs> well, the unknown hubris of naivete. I mean, yeah, sure. All right. So, um, so here's Jung, and his in the in his red book situation, he's having these visions which are coming to him, and this is this is the moment when he is realizing the existence of the collective unconscious. And he's, um, and maybe he didn't even fully realize it until s several years later. But um, you know, in this period before World War II or World War One, he had these uh, very powerful dreams and visions, which told him how th how bad things had gotten and how bad things were going to be, um, and. Uh, and he shuddered uh, over that and mm -hmm. he just he couldn't believe it but you know his psyche was telling him you know war is coming and uh, so anyway all right so going on to the next paragraph we shudder too when we survey the landscape of the sacred today and what is still to come our world has grown so far from the sacred that any approach of this reality to us is experienced as terrifying. So what did the crowd th think was sacred? You know, they, they, they thought the, the capital was sacred because, you know, they, in general, they did not destroy the capital. Okay, they broke a few windows, um, but, you know, they could have caused a lot more damage. But for example, in when they broke into the Senate, they didn't have in mind destroying the Senate. The Senate building was sacred to them. And they thought, oh, gee, you know, they didn't know what to do. They, they just um, sat in the chairs for a couple of time, for a couple of minutes because, wow, well, that seemed neat to do something neat to do. But they didn't go in there and, and, uh, and put fire bombs through that place and, and destroy the, you know, what truly is sacred uh, in, in those structures. I mean, obviously human life is sacred, but. Um, I've wondered if when they got to the well, you know, of the Senate, as we call it, that they were in the well and that tends to quiet. I mean, 200 and some years of energy in that room they dove into a pond that they were literally out of their depth, but they were yeah. in it. 
yeah, they were way out of their depth. They had no idea what to do. And, um, and thank God, okay, because they could have destroyed something mm -hmm. sacred. And, you know, Which shows the history and memory of place energetically yeah. and how we are affected by places of, say, peace or power. Yeah, and we still don't really know um, why Notre Dame burned, okay, last year. And, um, I mean, they think it was, you know, the excuse is that there were paints up in the attic or something like that and spontaneous um, combustion, but who knows how the fire really got started. But, you know, I never thought of uh, the Cathedral of Notre Dame in Paris as a sacred place to me, okay, because I'm a Protestant, I'm not a Catholic. Uh, I have visited it once. Uh, I was not uh, terribly moved uh, by, by the visit to uh, Notre Dame. It's, yeah, this is a nice church, but... <laughs> you know, <laughs> it's interesting you say that, and I, I love the counterpoint because I was crying. And yeah, but I was the, crying the, too. That that's the point. That was the easy. shocking part. And yeah, and that's shocking. Exactly. There you go. My stepmother though taught at the Sorbonne for six years. So when I went to France, there was a I had a whole different kind of tour guide, so to speak. Sure. And so that you you also were crying, and it wasn't especially indelible, you know, in your memories. Um, that's powerful. Yeah. I mean, I you know I. I had spent one day walking around Paris one time, I don't know, this was 20 years ago. And, you know, I went through Notre Dame. I didn't even take a tour. Uh, I looked at the, I looked at everything and then I went on with my day and probably appreciated my visit to Cafe Lip more than I appreciated the Notre Dame. You know, the serendipity, I walked in and they were having a choir recital. And so the, the choir is also up behind you. You do not see mm -hmm. the voice. So it's the voice of God, so to speak. And I, I just sat down on the floor. Mm -hmm. I mean, I just sat down on the floor and it's like, time to go. No, it's not time to go. You, I'll catch yeah. up with you guys later. It's <laughs> well, but, but what I'm saying is that when I turned on the television and saw the fire, um, I, I just immediately wept and I couldn't uncontrollably for a very long time, probably half an hour, 45 minutes, I was, I was in a puddle. And then um, I did my, my Monday night presentation that week. And, um, you know, it's, it's there on, on the channel if you want to look at it. And, um, you know, the, the first 10 minutes of that video is me saying absolutely nothing. All I did was hold up images of, of the cathedral in flames and I, I couldn't speak. Um, and uh, so something about Notre Dame is sacred. It's not something about Catholicism that's sacred to me because my ancestors were at war with the Catholics <clears throat> when they came. Well, and, and that the influenced, the influenced inducing of aphasia, just that really is a powerful experience. Aphasia, I mean, what is the word? Aphasia is the inability to speak. Your, your vocal okay. cords shut down um, by, right. and so that in a sense trauma, but the trauma of beauty is, you know, you're, you're being moved in, in yeah. such a way. Well, and, and plus the parliament of the of France, um, you know, before the fire, they, they weren't willing to give a million dollars a year to, to you know, maintain uh, Notre Dame, which is responsible for untold millions and billions of tourist dollars. But after the fire, they were willing to give a billion dollars to rebuild it. Uh, and, and so uh, they learned what is sacred, I guess. Okay. <clears throat> so anyway. Yeah. Um, you, you don't know how much you love it till it's gone. <laughs> That's a song. Yeah.
So our world has grown so far from the sacred that any approach to this reality to us is experienced as terrifying. Uh, not only has our resistance turned the sacred into a hostile force, but the sacred shows its negative face at this time. And so we certainly saw that on January 6th. Rudolf Otto designated the holy as a mysterium tremendum et fascinans, uh, a tremendous mystery and fascinating, I guess, is the translation of that Latin. It What's the word again? It's mysterium tremendum et fascinans. Um, okay. So, uh, so anyway, Rudolf Otto described it in Latin. <laughs> I'll translate it for the pedestrian Americans that are watching <laughs> the tre tremendous mystery and fascination. Okay. So, mm -hmm. uh, my reaction to the fire at Notre Dame uh, should have been sort of cool detachment, but it wasn't. Okay, and so that was a tremendous mystery and fascinating mystery that fa uh, that fascinates. But as tremendum, it evokes terror because it presents as an ominous, overwhelming power. And that's what I was feeling, an, uh, an overwhelming power at that moment. Uh, in a secular age in which the only authority we acknowledge is our human will and desiring, the sacred hovers over us like a cloud. Due to our stance, um, it is the darkness of the sacred that eclipses its positive and creative elements. Uh, and this gives it the complexion of, destruct of destructiveness. Okay, so uh, last week we were talking about the paragraph in Dr. Young's letter to, Dr., to Reverend David Cox, in which he talked about God being the unconscious. And so in all these examples that I have been giving, uh, for example, uh, the time I got furious at the, at the car salesman, um, I definitely felt something coming over me, something, something that was more powerful than I was. It was tremendous. And, um, and it caused this fury to come out of me. And um, the same thing was true uh, in my marriage when I was having these fights with my wife, uh, you know, they, they just would come up. And so uh, Dr. Young is definitely onto something when he says God is the unconscious, God equals the unconscious. And so in, in the case of January 6th, we see the collective unconscious um, is definitely more powerful than we are. I mean, if, if you had been in Washington that day and happened to have that crowd go by you, you would feel the hand of God. You would have felt the hand of God. Um, and, um, you know, it's not some uh, physical entity up there in the sky saying, ah, I'm, you know, I'm going to kill these people today type thing. No, it's, it's, but it is a powerful force. And um, so anyway, okay. Hence, as the sacred returns, the psychological effect is that our world feels under threat, and there is indeed much that the sacred seeks to dismantle. Uh, and so we certainly in the United States feel the United States is under threat right now. Um, and that the sacred, uh, the sacred of how our government works and that sort of thing that, um, is, is at risk. Uh, and we don't want to see it dismantled, but also I never thought it would be dismantled. <laughs> but, but I'm sure that there are a lot of people out there in the country, as Jordan and I saw uh, on, that, on the day in question, uh, we saw that uh, many in our group uh, were very fearful that, that the country would come apart. And, uh, 
and the interesting experience we had, and uh, Susan, you, you and uh, Gunnar and Yuan and Nelly weren't there, um, but we were in our advanced reading group that day uh, live, uh, and we were about halfway through that day's session, and my wife came in and started to give us headlines of what was going on uh, in real time. And, um, and there was a genuine fear in the group that the US military would uh, come to the aid of the crowd and keep Trump in power. And, um, and so that, that was a genuine fear that something was going to fundamentally change in the United States. And, you know, I just said, no, they won't. <laughs> but a lot of those people that were out there that day thought when the National Guard came out that the National Guard was coming to their aid. Now, that's people who um, don't know enough about the training and experience of of being in the US military. I have 20 years, 23 years experience of it. So I knew that, that the military was not gonna to come to the aid of Donald Trump. There was no way that's ever happening. And never, it wasn't then and it's not now, but you know, a lot of people are fearful for, of that. And that's, um, you know, fearful of, of a God, something that they can't control that could destroy the United States, and and yet, um, and yet that could never that you know in my experience that could never happen. But um, but there are plenty of people that were worried about that, and so I'll just read that sentence again. Hence, as the sacred returns, the psychological effect is that our world feel, feels under threat, and there is indeed much that the sacred seeks to dismantle. So yes, this is the dark side of God, definitely. And, uh, and if that had been allowed to continue in the way it was, it could have started to get pretty bad. And obviously um, we have the experience of the 20th century where uh, once Hitler passed a certain tipping point, um, the only way to stop him was after all the crockery had been broken in Western Europe, basically, and in Germany. I mean, until every piece of crockery in Western Europe had been destroyed, or certainly in Germany, uh, only then was it over. And, and so if you allow these things to get going, uh, they can, um, they can get out of control. And uh, there's a very interesting scene in the movie, uh, 13 Days, where, uh, and this is a movie about the Cuban Missile Crisis and, um, and the Russian ambassador has talked to Bobby Kennedy about, about what's going on. And he makes, he has this uh, line where he says, um, now we have to go see if we can stop this thing from taking over us, okay? This thing that he's talking about in that moment is, um, you know, the hand, the evil hand of God, which uh, came very close to destroying the world at that point or uh, major parts of it because we were so close, we were eyeball to eyeball and the other guy blinked, um, but if, if it had pressed on to, uh, you know, the guns of August, as, as uh, Kennedy was reading at that, or had just read the guns of August, which is, you know, one group starts shooting shells across, and then the next group starts to also, and pretty soon you've got a war going, and it, and it, it can't be stopped. And just... Uh, for an interesting sidelight here, we're working with Colleen about doodling uh, or about mark of the self. So it's, it's a process whereby um, you draw lines and, um, 
and then you fill the lines in. And so yesterday I, um, I said, okay, I just want to see what the self wants to talk to me about right now. And, um, and so I, I did all my lines uh, and there it looks like scribbling basically. Um, but then I said, okay, what's this about? I don't know. So I said, well, I haven't used red lately. So I use red <clears throat> and, um, and so I started to fill in the, the spots on the doodle uh, where red would go. And this is what I came up with <clears throat> so far. Okay, now this isn't finished yet, uh, but I, I found that I, that I needed red everywhere, that red, red flowed because the way I do these things, it's, they're like rivers. And so they flow, the river flows and you have to let, let it flow. <clears throat> and so uh, I said, well, what's all this red about? And what came to my mind uh, at that moment was uh, a line that is in the movie uh, Top Gun. And the, uh, the line, it's in a song uh, when Tom Cruise is in the attack and it says, no way out while you're in it. Um, that's the line. And so I look back at my, my image now and I said, okay, what's it? this is about war. Okay, and so what is, the, um, what is the unconscious telling me about war? Because there's a lot of blood here. I haven't even finished the red yet. And so, um, so the name of this piece uh, is, is now, and it came to me from the unconscious. I didn't sit down and consciously decide that I was going to do a mark of the self about war. I did a random doodle, and then I just picked a color because I hadn't used that color lately. And all of a sudden, I have blood everywhere here. And what comes to my mind is no way out while you're in it. And then I said, okay, this is about war because it's reminding me of that. And so that's myself telling, talking to me about the collective unconscious. That's what it's doing right there. That's, that's exactly what it's doing. You know, Skip, what it came to mind earlier, I, I hadn't I just opened it right up. A, a book, Terror and Decorum uh, by Peter Vyrek. It's a collection <clears throat> of poems from 1940 to 48. And it, it, I just jumped right to mind. There's, if I may read just three stanzas okay. of a, a poem, the poem is entitled always to love you, America, always to fight you with the subtext <laughs> quote, New York ain't America as an ancient proverb. It'll be two voices, one America, one New York. So okay. America, don't think I haven't watched you. There's a cure for towns too un-American. Don't think I'll let some alien hurricane blow down the fence that keeps my suburbs pure. New York, your forests now are fences. And of late, you talk less of frontiers and more of real estate. That's boring to the unseen spirit throng of dancers laughing south of right and wrong, whose footsteps groove the patterns of our fate and whom it's dangerous to bore for too long. And America responds, I know you, you were always my stab in the back, doubter at picnics, drugstore heretic. You were always the stowaway who wouldn't go away. Already that time on the Mayflower when I was the Psalm, the captain read to all the fine folks overhead, you were the dirty joke below the deck. Yeah, um, well, it's, it feels it's, so just apt speaks, to describe that scene. Right, and it speaks definitely to uh, why poetry is important. And uh, there's there's a Irish art, uh, poet about my age now named David White, and uh, I, David White became very popular in the 1990s during the men's movement. 
And uh, I, I remember one thing that he said. He said, um, you can't get the news from newspapers. Um, you can only get the news from poems, okay? Mm -hmm. that, that poetry and as we're learning imagery also um, tells us what the news is. And so, um, you know, as I'm seeing in the emergence of uh, my mark of the self here uh, for next Tuesday, the, um, my image is another form of poetry, my unconscious telling me something about the civil war that we're maybe at only at the beginning stages of in the United States. And, and, uh, you know, that pairs so wonderfully with Mark Twain's, um, if you don't read the paper every morning, you're uninformed. But if you do read the paper every morning, you are misinformed. Yeah. So that, you know, get, get your news from poetry rather than the paper. <laughs> or lawsuits. <laughs> Go or ahead, lawsuits, Susan. right, exactly. Or lawsuits, because you read too much news. <laughs> Susan, you were going to say? Yeah, I'm just um, saying Mark Twain, he's so great. So, so sort of sharp and clear. <clears throat> he's absolutely great. Yep. And over a hundred years ago, you know, it's so it's, it's he's he's still so non postmodern. He's still modern. Right. Um, <clears throat> okay. So going on with this paragraph, <laughs> and and Susan, uh, this is your first invitation <laughs> to this eight a.m. Sunday morning thing, which we've been doing for about six months now, but, or longer than that, nine months. But um, the, um, it, it's very typical for us to get through only a paragraph. Last, paragraph. Week, <laughs> last week, we got through one paragraph of, of a 10 page letter that Dr. Young wrote that's in uh, uh, the new God image um, as we talk through this. So anyway, on this- Don't pack in the messages. On this paragraph, yeah. Hence, as the sacred returns, uh, the psychological effect is that our world feels under threat. And there is indeed much that the sacred seeks to dismantle. Uh, it has been said that the divine mirrors the face that is turned toward it. And if we denounce the sacred, it will in turn adopt a foreboding attitude. As we run away, its pursuit of us will not be seen as loving, but we'll we will experience it. it. We will experience its anger and wrath. So this is a clear statement to us. And this, this essay was written a decade or not a decade ago, but several years ago. And uh, so obviously if we turn our back on these American citizens who are hurting so much that their anger and wrath erupted, uh, it's going to chase us down and we have to address it. Um, we live in an age of terrorism and this is not without significance to our spiritual situation. Our inner and outer lives have a certain similitude at this time, but few have pointed to this synchronicity because the prevailing voices are secular and do not look beyond appearances. Okay, so a couple things in that synchronicity is, uh, as Dr. Jung explained, an eight causal connecting principle, which means that, um, you know, nobody consciously um, planned for uh, the collective unconscious to erupt in the way that it did on January 6th, but nonetheless, uh, it did. And um, well, and that synchronicity, I mean, even, you know, Jung's the, the wonderfully verbose and a causal connecting principle. Right. I mean, so it, it, the definition of synchronicity being that and um, it's a tiny little book, too. But again, so dense. Right. Um, and also the point about the prevailing voices are secular. So so the problem that we have right now is that we have, you know, the majority, I would say, of men, especially going around uh, thinking that there's nothing sacred. There's only facts that we see on the world. There's, there's only 
things that we see in the world and those are the only things that are mat that matter but in point of fact um they're the things that don't matter <laughs> well and it, it goes along the lines of the old quote of truth is transitory human life is the only thing real but if you don't get out of the solipsistic trap which only the self exists kind of thing and turn back inward there's the truth so it's okay. a circle, but it, it does, they end up going, human life's the only thing real. But then they don't see the Eros Logos, sacred and profane, within it to take the situation to be sacred. Um, so uh, another aspect of this, this particular session that we do is that it's intended for people who have English as a second language, particularly in Europe and in... Uh, in parts of Asia. And uh, so it happens at eight o'clock in the morning in the US where most Americans are not uh, awake so that others can hear, uh, so that others can hear a more simple, simple way of talking. And so Jordan has used the term solipsistic. So then I'll uh, open that to be- Therefore yeah. you have to explain the word right. and, and we so, have to try to avoid using these words. Right, and also sometimes use them to educate, to expand as well. Um, but solipsism is the, th the philosophy that only the self exists. So it kind of runs in parallel with the idea of is the question, is life just a dream? Because you're the center of the universe the problem is, problem is it's, it's rather childish philosophically because it's a notion of um, why, say, uh, Galileo would be imprisoned or because the sun, what do you mean the sun doesn't rotate around the earth? So solid system is just that where the whole world revolves around you. And in a sense, it's a high dollar word for narcissism. Right. And, and so... Uh... Dr. Edinger talks about solipsistic megalomania, of which mm -hmm. uh, Donald Trump is the poster boy, <clears throat> uh, because he, he, he thinks that everything revolves around him. He never showed a single sign of caring for the American people during his four years in office, only about himself. <clears throat> and so that's the solip system, uh, system and and on the turn side, I, the solipsistic megalom megalomania, I, in college, I jokingly um, made up the philosophy solipsistic transcendentalism, um, except all of a sudden the joke turned back on me because I'm going, oh, this is young. So, I mean, it, in a sense that it was started out as a joke, um, you know, freshman triple major, architecture, philosophy and psychology, and the joke quickly turned back on me. When the chairman of the philosophy department said, "Will you please unpack those two words as they work together?" and I never used it again. So it's <laughs> yeah. okay. <clears throat> so <clears throat> Dr. Tacy goes on. It takes a symbolic attitude to read the signs of the times for their inward significance. Um, synchronicity is an a causal connecting principle. I am not saying that the spiritual climate is causing terrorism only that there is a meaningful parallelism. <clears throat> so um, we are missing a spiritual aspect in our country, or a lot of us are. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and even people like me, who, you know, I, I still am very respectful of the Christian religion, um, but, you know, I... I came along at a time when uh, I was raised entirely on the logos. And so I, I never could feature what God was. And in the context of the way Christians present it, um, I cannot, I, I still can't, <laughs> uh, but I can acknowledge that there is God. I can acknowledge that the Christian religion, like all other religions, has addressed um, God in one way or another, and that uh, we should try to understand what 
our religions are telling us. Um, so going on, the sacred, <clears throat> the sacred today is a complex field in which anger, violence, terrorism, and conflict are intermixed with redemptive possibilities of love, hope, and transformation. The sacred is linked with war and revenge, fundamentalism, moribund doctrines, an epidemic of clerical sexual abuse and loss of belief. Yet in the midst of all this chaos, the sacred is returning. According to Jacques Derrida, uh, this is an urgent and pressing reality and society needs to adjust itself to the new conditions. Quote, Whatever side one takes in the debate about the return of the religious, one still must respond and without waiting, without waiting too long, unquote. Like Derrida, I don't think we have time to procrastinate as the return of the sacred demands a response no matter what our beliefs. And so as we saw in the return of the dark side of God on January 6th, um, we have to respond. We can't just brush it off. <clears throat> when I think of the return of the sacred images rise of floodwaters in the bed of the Todd River in Alice Springs, Australia, the town in which I grew up. Normally the river is dry, but after storms, the tide becomes a swirling torrent, but the, wa <clears throat> but the waters that emerge are not pristine or clear. The floodwaters are dark, muddy, turbulent, and at its head, uh, there is a wall of sludge and debris. The waters that emerge, that emerge later in the desert landscape are less murky, but there is always a sense that the floodwaters remain polluted. And so, you know, what a great metaphor for what has been happening uh, in the U.S. the last month. Well, oh, the flush. Yeah, and... And so, you know, we've had the, these floodwaters of, of uh, resentment overflowing their banks. And, um, you know, I, I guess everybody has a certain amount of resentment. Um, you know, we, we are resentful when we're sent to the principal's office in school. We're resentful when our mother or father spanks us <laughs> you know there's a there's a lot of resentment going around and the question is um how much is too much and so what we know well, that in, breaks the question of also how to relinquish the resentment by opening it up i think as susan had mentioned before of can you address the resentment or is it an indelible scar um is it able to be transformed and healed, or is it something you now just have to live with, I think is the question there. Well, it is an indelible scar, scar and none of us will forget it, so it, you do have to live with it. Um, but, uh, but the question it just, is, can, it makes we, me wonder, can we live with it? Okay. Well, can it makes we me wonder, does it beg a larger question of how can we defeat the onset by... Um, maintenance and um, basically health. Uh, how can we be, how can we basically as a military person, I guess might say, embrace the suck? And how can we make ourselves uncomfortable intentionally for a little while to really go in without blame storming and take a look and go, what is the causative principle here? What is the active agent? And actually well, your six words, nature is the magical agent. And so what is the nature of the psychology that's driving it, which is gonna be trauma, we know that, but where, what, and how becomes the alchemy and the dynamism, which yeah. is well, we the have research. To, we have to remember vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. Okay, so there's lots of, lots of people who, you know, wanna slam the people that were at the Capitol. And some of them certainly uh, deserved to be thrown behind bars for many years uh, because they committed assault and battery and murder. Um, but uh, in terms of the greater good, it's, it's not clear uh, that 
prosecuting Donald Tr Trump is the right answer. Um, and, well, is uh, the vengeance is mine? Uh, isn't that a parallel with an eye for an eye and a tooth for tooth makes the world go blind? Right, and and so a, as we as we punish now for um, for these events, uh, we have to be careful because uh, the, you know. Uh, the 20th century provides us with perfect metaphors for the situation. After World War I, um, we forced the Treaty of Versailles, not we, but uh, the Allies forced the, the Treaty of Versailles. And that was a punitive document. And it, the intention of it, the clear intention of it was to punish the Germans. So what did it do? It created resentful people, and uh, especially women. Okay, now we have to keep in mind that women are the glue that keeps uh, civilization together and rebuilds it after civilization has been destroyed. And so after World War I, roughly 10 million men killed on the battlefields of France, and um, it was the women that had to produce the next generation. And what were they filled with? Well, they were filled with resentment about their, I mean, in Germany, they were filled with resentment about their situation because they were forced into abject poverty. And uh, they probably had to make a lot of concessions um, about propriety that they might not otherwise have wanted to make. And they, they built up an entire generation of Germans that was resentful. However, after World War II, when we rebuilt the two major powers, um, Germany and Japan, we rebuilt them and said, okay, the war's over, now let's move on. Um, that was, that created the strongest allies in the American uh, constellation of allies. So Germany and Japan are our best allies today. And um, Marshall Plan, right. Right. Yeah. And so what we have to do is we have to look at the situation that we have at, um, at the um, Capitol and say, okay, how do we um, rebuild uh, what has been lost, and and part of that, the resentment that uh, was displayed there, um, that comes from the red states, is you know we allowed, or not we, but the government allowed, uh, and and our industrialists allowed the the very source of income for the red states to get exported to China, essentially, and other places, but China was the main beneficiary. And, and so now, you know, <laughs> the Marine Corps can't go to war because we don't make shoes in the United States anymore. We make them in China. So, okay, what are we going to do <laughs> if, we, <laughs> if, we, uh, if we have a war with China? We're not going to be able to buy shoes for the for the military, that's a little awkward. I, mean, <laughs> I haven't thought about it's great that. To, it's that's... great to have tanks and F-18s, but if the guys don't have like, yeah. shoes to wear, you got to... That makes for a serious Achilles heel. I mean, right. no pun intended. I mean, that's... <laughs> yeah, and so... Um, so we have to see what, what's reality. We can't expect uh, every average person living in a red state to understand these things and um, and probably what we need to do is get some entrepreneurship going <laughs> you know because um, because the auto industry is never coming back to the to the rest the so-called rust belt that, that's not happening but if we helped people understand where um, industry has created holes, uh, you know, then, then uh, 
you know, cottage industry could come up and, and fill in jobs. Now, I'll give you an example. Um, in the industry that I was working in, in uh, medical records, um, when I started, there were about, I would say, 30 or 40 sizable country, companies in the industry. And over a period of 10 years, one company uh, started to dominate. So when I first started, there were 20 or 30 companies, but within 10 years, there was one big company and four little ones, one of which was mine, it turned out. But what happened was that people saw holes around what the dominant kind of company was doing. And so they started to create businesses in niche, niche areas. Um, and so within, from the time that there was only one big company and three or four little ones till let's say three years later, then there was 20 companies again because that's what entrepreneurship does. Entrepreneurship sees uh, the void, sees what's not getting done by the big company and then fills into that space. And, um, and that's- So if I may, your, your four little companies were then um, discerning what was missing in the symbol to read the culture of the larger company. Right. And, and not only what was missing in the symbol, but what was missing in the larger company itself, because my little company, which was founded essentially in 1998, in 2005, bought 70% of the big company and became the largest company in the industry. Um, and, and that was because... Um, of the arrogance of the big company or the executives in the big company. And so they thought they were sitting on top of the world and they had gone public, but um, they hadn't thought about the fact that their biggest shareholder was a European company. And so in the US, they thought they were untouchable but in Europe, the company that had bought that 70% didn't like them. <laughs> and so we simply went and bought that share and suddenly we owned them. Um, right. And, and so. It's a big guy. You can't beat them, join them. That's a. <laughs> yeah. And so, so what we need to do is show our fellow Americans how they can go around these events. I mean, okay, your job, your job just got sent to China, but you know, as a result of that fact, things are not happening that should be happening. And if, if you can identify those things in that industry, then uh, you can uh, make a big difference. I mean, we're seeing that in the auto industry again in the U S where apparently uh, today we're having the Super Bowl and, and both Ford and G GM are going to be announcing that they're going to have electric vehicles in 15 years exclusively. No more, uh, no more piston engines. Well, I'll, I'll believe it when I see it. But at the same time, um, you know, one of my partners in the medical records business went on to start creating um, uh, parking meters for electric vehicles about a decade ago. And it seemed like a, a silly thing to, to be making parking meters for electric vehicles, but all of a sudden, hey, by the way, we're gonna need lots of those, <laughs> you know, where you can plug your car in when you, when you stop. And so um, uh, those opportunities do present themselves, but it, we can't have a population that's just relying on a big company to give them a job. Here's what you do. You move this part from this point position to this point position on the assembly line and you're good. Then you can go out and have a good life uh, on in your day off. Well, um, you know, that's, that's a little bit like depending on, you know, on God, right? And, right. and, and so what we have to understand is that God is within us and we have to find the solution. Um, 
Well, and I would say, imagine you, you hit chapter five of Ion, where Christ is self, and it takes you a decade, and you are an educated, thoughtful individual. Right. Imagine someone who that just traumatizes and startles, that statement itself becomes the enemy. Um, and rather than you who chewed on it, you were startled by it, you were thought it was maybe absolute bunk and BS, but then... You no, know, I didn't think it was bunk, but I, it was certainly startling. Okay, right, when, and so when but I, 10 years I, later, you came to it, and, and that to me tells... In the, in the culture we're speaking of, then that puts them at about 100 years if they ever do. Because there's a concept that is so alien that there's not a dignity of difference in those, in those um, culture aspects. Right. And okay, they, so, let, so let's talk about yeah. that in, in connection with the sacred. Okay, so chapter five of Ion is Christ as a symbol of the self. And because I was marginally raised as a Christian. Uh, I went to Sunday school a few times and so on. Um, I, you know, when I read that, that title, I said, are you talking about the son of God? How, you know, what does that mean? And, um, you know, and, I, and what Jung was saying was not that there is no God and it was not that Christ is not the son of God. It was that uh, God is something different from what Christianity taught me. Okay? Right. What I got taught in Christianity was God is up there and he's like a Geppetto who's going to pull our strings and, yeah. and give us nice things on Christmas type stuff. And um yeah, the adult version of the Easter Bunny. I mean, right. it's like right, and and so that's what I was. That's the way I thought about God at right. that time. And in point of fact, now I absolutely know that there is God. Okay, and and um, and it's not a question of belief now for me, um, right. but. But I had to come around to how Jung was looking at it and thinking about it before I could feature that. Uh, okay, so Sharon May says, until the larger company takes it, the little company does, does creates and proves the strength of the idea, and then the big company swoops down and co and co-ops it. Yeah. Okay. So that that's a constant process. In other words big company gets too big and there it leaves opportunities on the on the playing field and then entre entrepreneurs can uh, capitalize on those opportunities when those opportunities build up into something bigger um, then uh, very often what happens is the big company comes and buys that out um, and and so the entrepreneur is happy because he created a company that they bought out. Um, but it, it's just a, it's kind of the, the breath of, of life in industry where first companies get larger and larger and larger, and then they, um, and then they miss things because large companies can't see everything. And then uh, they get, smaller companies start to succeed again and, and so on. It's like breathing um, in entrepreneurship. Uh, okay, so let me read on with this paragraph. That's actually a really good digestive meta metaphor for entrepreneurship. It's like you eat till you get full and then you eliminate and then you eat till you get full. So that process long form, um, I haven't thought about it that way, big fish, little fish, in that cycle. Yeah. Uh, so Max Brabner says, good morning all. Skip, I'd like to know more about the events that came to your knowing of God. Uh, and so there is a, there is a uh, talk that I gave on this YouTube channel, uh, which I can find for you quickly. Um, 
called uh, Finding the Living God. And so let me give you the link to that. I think I can get it quickly. Uh, and you need to look at that uh, because that's a hour and a half long <laughs> talk that I gave. Um, and so I'm oh, and then that place you flesh it out. I mean, and that would make for a better discussion. Yeah. Um, and jeez, uh, maybe it's not so easy to find the uh, find the link. Wait a minute, I can get it, but it, it'll take me a minute here. Um, you mean to just hop on the Google Oracle and? No, I mean, I've, I've, I've there. got it. I, I've okay. got it. I was just looking right. at it. I was just being stupid in the way I looked at it, looked for <laughs> it, but I now have it. So just a moment. Um, okay. All right. Um, so this is a link to uh, finding the living God, and here's the link. And so if you watch that video, you will find all about how I know God and don't have to believe anymore. Um, and, uh, and so she answered. So Sharon says, uh, she's responding to my comment about large companies, she says not buys it out, it co-ops the idea and competes, out competes the smaller company. Well, it happens in a variety of ways, Sharon, uh, not only that, but you're correct that that's one way. Um, one thing is that um, they buy it out. Another way thing is they um, steal the idea you know, I'm currently working with a situation where um, my company, company that I've been involved with for about 20 years, uh, sold its software um, to another company in 2017 for $50 million, believe it or not. And, um, and it co-opted the the people involved by hiring them. And it got all the information, of course, about the software that, that we had developed. And um, it, it did one thing that, and so, but basically it, it stole because it didn't pay the $50 million, okay? And it didn't properly pay, um, uh, the royalties for the software. And so uh, a year ago, my colleague took the software back because he had not been paid. And so now we have the software back, whereas uh, our company, the company that I'm involved with currently uh, for the last three years was worth nothing because it had no, no asset in it because those assets had been sold off. But um, suddenly because the other company didn't pay the royalties boom we had the asset back and oh by the way the last time we sold it we sold it for 50 million dollars so guess what can happen again at some point in the future so you know there's other there there are various ways that this happens and that's what competition and in, in business is about um so anyway Mm -hmm. So the, that's a great circular example too of the long form tennis match. Um, then you you stay vigilant, you stay on watch, and then you know and the transaction was actually never completed. So there's so many things going on there in a way. Well, part that, of it was completed. So the other well, company thought that it had had uh, digested the software, and it probably did in one way or another. Uh, and so now we're competing against it, but it claims that it's it's changed the software enough so that it doesn't have to pay royalties right. uh, for the software anymore. But oh, by the way, um, the original software was pretty damn good the first time around. So um, uh, so you can use it to compete So we can back, use it right. and, and go back 
against them and that they're a colossally large company. So uh, they almost won't even realize what we're doing. So right. um, anyway, all right. So the rising sacred is like this river. Its waters are destined to replenish our lives, but there is an impurity at present. The sacred is a paradoxical and ambivalent reality associated with as much bad as good. I can see why many have become atheists in the face of this turbulence of violence, wrath, and terrorism. Uh, many don't want to be associated with the sacred, seeing it as the source of evil, as, for example, Richard Dawkins, Sam Harris, and Christopher Hitchens have argued. I understand this point of view, and through a certain lens, it does seem as they claim that the holy is what pollutes and gives a stench of de decomposition in our lives. The new atheists reverse the religious view that the sacred is the source of goodness and light and evil derives from us and our sinful distortions. Personally, I have always held both views, strange as it may seem. I believe the sacred is the source of goodness and light, but I understand that in our distorted time, the sacred is associated with the wall of sludge, debris, and darkness that comes ahead of the flood. And so um, I concur with Dr. Casey here that um, the you know, January 6th was the coming of the sludge and the darkness and the debris and detritus. But at the same time, um, it also provides us with the um, fertilizer with which we can uh, save America because the United States um, has never been perfect and it doesn't claim to be as as Amanda Gorman said uh, it's uh, a teeming nation of nations and so um, you know we we have a lot of ideas emerge and what happens is and one of those ideas is donald trump's idea that he can shoot a bullet down fifth avenue and nobody cares well actually we do care and uh, a lot of us care and uh and his shooting that crowd down the street to the capitol on the 6th of january is not acceptable to most americans and uh, it, it will not stand in the end one way or another. Um, and because what we have built in the United States is sacred. It is a manifestation of God, if you will. I mean, um, what is the, the one what is the one secret sauce that makes the United States the tr strongest economy and the strongest military in the world? Okay, what is it? Because there were others. Britain was obviously a, a world power in the 19th century and, um, and before that. And so what, what about the U.S. caused that to, uh, caused the U.S. to emerge? And um, okay, well, okay, there's a comment here from Coleman Remington, which was, uh, which was mo uh, moderated, but I've allowed his comment. Um, but the, the point is, uh, I'm making a greater uh, point about a manifestation of God here, which is what is the one factor above all others that makes the United States what it is? And that is an undeniable fact that we have people from every country in the world. Uh, number one, we have people from every country in the world. And number two, um, we have people who want to come here and become U.S. Americans 
uh, from every country in the world. There's no other country in the world that's like that. Um, and what, why is that? Well, it, the secret sauce, it turns out, and I, I spent 15 years uh, actually investigating this question uh, with people all over the world asking that question. And it's a stump the stars question. Uh, if you ask people, you know, what's the one factor above all others that makes the United States so strong? And very simply, the answer is our diversity. And why is that? Well, the answer is that um, every time a good idea emerges in the United States, we all adopt it. And, um, and every time a bad idea emerges, we beat it out of the system, either by debate, often noisy debate, uh, or, um, you know, violently one way or another. And so, obviously, what happened on January 6th is not acceptable. We can't allow that sort of behavior to continue. And, uh, it, and it will stop one way or another. Um, and, uh, but at the same time, it highlights some things that we do need to change and we do need to pay attention to in our politics. And so the US, the United States as a country is going to be stronger for January 6th, not weaker. Um, and um, and that's the way it works. And actually the same process is happening on a global basis because, and we see it, we, we see the American sort of character way of being unconsciously slipping into all of humanity one way or another. And I've been traveling the world for a long enough time to know that there, the similarities between uh, communist China and the United States are pretty dramatic. Okay. Now, you wouldn't have said that 30 years ago when I was, when I was, uh, or 50 years ago when I was studying Chinese at Defense Language Institute. Um, but I remember being in Saudi Arabia one time and my, my host took me up on this little hill above Riyadh and he said, you know, Skip, in, um, in 20 years, the Saudi Arabia is going to be like the States. And I looked out over the scene in front of us, below us, and from my, from my lights, it looked like Southern California now, okay? And the reason is on the horizon, what could I see? McDonald's, Pizza Hut, Burger King. <laughs> and and if, you, if you're on the roads, um, <clears throat> half the automobiles are American cars. And so it looks like Amer an American highway. I mean, even Americans don't buy <laughs> more than 50% of our cars from American cars. Most of us, including me, have, or many, half of us, including me, have foreign cars. I have a Japanese car and, um, or a Japanese uh, origin car. And so, <clears throat> so the whole world is changing like that. And, um, I remember the first time I went to Tiananmen Square, I went there with uh, my second daughter and we uh, walked from our hotel this uh, block to the to Tiananmen Square. It was quite close. And I looked at, out over the Tiananmen Square. And so here on the right was the uh, palace of the Chinese emperors, uh, which is a huge structure, okay? And on the left was the Great Hall of the People. And between it, about, you know, there's over, probably over a mile in one direction of the of Tiananmen Square. But what's popping up over, over the uh, horizon of Tiananmen Square? The Golden Arches. <laughs> and, and so um, 
that is, and uh, actually I, I know of at least two uh, golden arches in, um, in, in China, uh, in Beijing. Gunnar just mentioned something on, uh, Gunnar just mentioned something on the chat that there's now McDonald's in Iceland. And there's a, yeah, there, there is now a McDonald's and no, there is there is not. And oh, he's glad not. there's not. And that's it's it's a good thing. Well, sure, because because Iceland has has been privileged with watching the development of McDonald's and realizing that it might not be a good thing. But it's mostly salt airbrushed to look like food. Yeah, but but Gunnar, I, I would I, I wouldn't be too confident about that because you might see one <laughs> pop up next week you never know uh you know i i was blown away when i got to Tiananmen square and saw on the horizon the golden arches i said oh my god and the, he actually that... responded that there were five of them um but after the 2008 crisis they closed down right and then yuan said that starbuck is was in the for was in the Forbidden City once. Yeah. Uh, so, so maybe uh, Starbucks has been done away with in the Forbidden City. That's entirely mm -hmm. possible. Um, but in the in the end, it's it's only the brand that has been has been eliminated, not the idea. Uh, so I'm sure I'm sure there are uh, coffee shops and tea shops and in China. Uh, and so uh, the fundamental idea of Starbucks, which in, back in the day, none of this could feature paying $5 for a cup of coffee, but none of, <laughs> nonetheless we did. And, and uh, so I imagine there are uh, expensive coffee and tea shops in Tiananmen Square uh, to this day or near it, if not uh, at it. And uh, and Gunnar, I'm pretty pretty sure that you can find unhealthy food in in Iceland. Maybe I'm wrong, but I've never been to Iceland. But I would I would suggest that that fast food is a, is a thing, even if it's not called McDonald's. Um, and uh, you know the thing that that surprised me when I went to Saudi Arabia was I was working. Uh, in a hospital there, uh, and there were four Starbucks cafes in the building, in the building, okay, four. And what's amazing about that is that the founder of Starbucks is a known Zionist. <laughs> and so how did that happen? I, I don't know. And you know, I, I wouldn't be surprised, me having drawn attention to it, I wouldn't be surprised to go back again in five years time and find it called uh, some Arabic name and not Starbucks, but nonetheless, the idea is there. Um, and uh, let's see. Well, that makes a point too with fast food and the, the less, nutri less nutrition per ounce basically and then that's feeding so much of America, the world, that, I mean, is that actually irritating the body, causing a physiological trauma of a lack of nourishment? I mean, as a thought, um, I mean, but God forbid I take away someone's Popeyes or, you know, and certainly not pizza, because, you know, I, if you go into the pizza wagon, I'll fight you. <laughs> so, right. So, uh, AOS here has asked me, commented, uh, Jung suggested that the problem of Wotan would be solved here in the US. Uh, what do you make of this, Skip? Hope all's well. Okay, so the answer uh, to this question, um, it, it's not just the US. Uh, uh, he actually said it about the Western democracies, um, not only the US. Uh, so we would have to include um, Canada and the UK and and some of the other countries of Western Europe, but and clarify too, just for the audience as well, Wotan. Well, Wotan is a um, 
is an archetype um, that Dr. Jung wrote about in the 1930s uh, as something that was emerging. The arch archetypes are, are patterns that emerge uh, from the unconscious. And so Wotan is a pattern that emerged in Western Europe, particularly in the, in the Nordic countries. Um, and, um, and in Germany too. And so Jung warned that this archetype was taking over the, the German psyche and was leading to World War II. So uh, unfortunately he, he was very, very subtle about this. I mean, it, it was his only warning about what was happening in Germany that he published in 1936. Uh, and it's in volume 12, or I'm sorry, volume 10 of the collected works of C.G. Jung entitled Civilization in Transition. And so civilization transforms uh, by forces that we're, we're not even conscious of. They, it transforms in the unconscious. And what happened in Germany, um, and where Donald Trump made his mistake is that German men pretty much had a, a common psyche. Okay, in other words, um, in Weimar Germany, pre-World War I, uh, German men pretty much fought alike. And, um, and that continued on into the 20s and 30s and uh, men and women, okay? And so they pretty much thought alike. And so when, when Hitler planted an idea in their head, so for example, he, in every one of, or most of his speeches, he would mention the Diktat of Versailles, um, the Treaty of Versailles, but he called it the, the Diktat of Versailles. Um, everybody in Germany knew what he meant. Everybody in Germany was resentful about the Treaty of Versailles. And so all he had to do was say it and it brought up all these images and all this resentment in the German people. So everybody was pretty much thinking in the same way. And, um, but that in the United States that can't happen because we all come from different ethno-psychological backgrounds of different types. And, um, and so if one group gets, gets uppity, the other groups take care of them, okay? And so, uh, for example, um, after the potato famine, uh, well, what, what's not widely known is that there are approximately 4 million Irishmen in Ireland and about 40 million in the United States. Um, and um, one of them is my son-in-law. <laughs> and so, um, and what people don't know is that uh, Dutchmen are both very liberal typically and have been for centuries uh, and yet also very hard-headed. And so mm -hmm. sometimes people have referred to me as a dark, hard-headed Dutchman, although that's only a quarter of my, my parentage. But, uh, but nonetheless, um, you know, um, so the Irish came to the United States because of the potato famine in the 1840s and there was great poverty there and they thought that there was opportunity in the US and they were right. And so they created a life for themselves, which was uh, a lot of poverty at the beginning, but then they decided, then they found a business that they could ha handle and that was policing. And so um, to this day, um, uh, Irishmen um, control the police in 
in Massachusetts, around Boston especially, but also in other uh, parts of the, of the United States as well. And you'll find many Irish in the police force. And, um, and other groups found other things uh, or started restaurants or what have you. So we have so much diversity that if one group gets uppity, the others are going to put them down <laughs> and, and they're not going to stand for it. And so even these white supreme supremacists who are currently getting uppity, um, they're, we're not going to stand for them destroying our country, not for a minute. And, and what Donald Trump didn't understand a few things. First of all, um, he thought that, that his base um, was the equivalent of the SA in Germany. Okay, so the SA was basically a private army that um, Hitler created uh, in, the, in the 20s. And they were basically a bunch of thugs. And if you didn't go their way, they would go beat you up. And they started wearing uniforms and so on. Um, and so they were very proud. And but Hitler, what Hitler did to the SA was one fine night, he arrested all their leaders and executed them. And so uh, I forget Rome's first name, but Rome and others were executed and they went to their deaths saying, Heil Hitler, um, you know, shouting Heil Hitler before the, the shots rang out. And, um, but Hitler wasn't loyal to them, but, but they were a, an existing force. They were, they were established as basically as a private army, but Trump hasn't created a private army. What he's uh, created is a bunch of opinionated people. But um, if you look at the average overweight of the insurrectionists at the Capitol on June 6th, you know that they couldn't be an army. <laughs> and, and indeed, four of them dropped dead in the event. Uh, when Gunnar mentions in the web on the chat too, the Nazis were obsessed with North mytho mythology and symbols. Right, and so in terms of of Wotan, they were obsessed with that that symbolism, and so they started to enact that symbolism. That's what right. they did, and and so the more they enacted it, the more it became true, and and so, um, but. But we don't have we don't have a homogeneous society here. We have a heterogeneous society, right. and and uh, and rather than a melting pot that makes a bunch of mud, it's about dignity of difference and things yeah. spicing up the system. I mean, it, it's it's not vanilla. That's not the right. <laughs> and, and, and it and it does change over years. I mean, in mm -hmm. in three generations, it's almost invisible. Okay. Um, and so when we, when you talk to me and you know, I'm an American, you can't tell what my ethnic heritage is um, right. anymore if, if I didn't tell you. And I even the crisscross of vernacular accents. I mean, I'm right. from Texas. You would never know it when I speak. I mean, yeah. just, you know, it's, that's right. You don't sound like a Philadelphian either. No, I don't. <laughs> right. I mean, I'm, I'm kind of a almost non. It's like, but at the same time, there is accent, but it's um, it's multiple, you know, in right. such a way that it, it kind of almost averages out to zero. Right. And in in my my language, uh, I speak, um, or at least I used to speak American military, which is. A southern accent, pretty much. Mm -hmm. I mean, I've, right. I've changed that, but I can, I can fake it. And <laughs> right, you know, I can, yeah, I can. <laughs> and and so I can so, get into a serious conversation 
Rather, right, and whether so y'all or y'all is apostrophized. So, you know, the the you're absolutely right that the right. that the Germans saw themselves as living out the archetype of Wotan, and and they all agreed with that. Uh, but if if you said in the United States we're all going to live out one archetype. In the United States, you know, nobody would agree with it, <laughs> right? Or it wouldn't have the legs to make it. I mean, it it it, it just would get too tired. And and so, um, you know, so there is an American archetype, but it's pretty hard to define in in terms of ethnicity or language or anything else. And you know, I remember. 30 years ago when I started doing uh, work in India, um, it was very under, difficult to understand Indian English. We used to call it English. Uh, and it, it basically was based on British English where the British had uh, controlled India for 250 years, the so-called Raj. And, um, but in the 30 years time since uh, I started doing that, now if I talk to an Indian, they sound like Americans. And the, right. internet, the internet has, has basically done that and homogenized language all around the world. And so uh, today it's less common to find a Japanese that doesn't speak fairly decent American English if they're speaking English at all. And, and uh, but back in the, um, back when I was in high school, you almost couldn't understand a Japanese that was speaking English. Uh, and there are reasons for that. There are big reasons for that, but. Um, well, the language, language enunciation has different, um, different predominant modes and different speaking different languages cause the tongue and the voice to be able to articulate differently. Yeah. And, and basically what the Japanese had done before the sixties, let's say is, or, you know, before the seventies is they had phoneticized English using phonetic characters. And so, um, so the result was that, they weren't speaking, they weren't saying a, a word uh, the way we would say it. Uh, they would say it the way they would say it in their phonetic language. That, the hooked on phonics kind of gig, yeah, right? Right. And, and but now uh, they don't learn English that way. They learn English from movies or from the internet or whatever. And, and so... Uh, the, the, their speaking of English is much different today. Uh, so yes, going back to the issue of Wotan, Weimar Germany had all these like-minded German men who wanted to live out that archetype. I mean, they not a question of wanting to, it was in their psyche. But in the US, we don't have a common archetype like that and so uh, we, we can't all circle around it except that Donald Trump did become an archetype okay he became a kind of archetype a kind of uh, uh, strongman archetype that um, that you know attra tr attracts power because people need a leader. And this is the problem that we have in our politics because we don't have many leaders, okay? We, uh, but what's going to happen is, uh, mark my words, Adam Kissinger, uh, who, or K Kissinger, I guess his name is, he's an, he's an Illinois Republican, and he's holding the line against uh, Trumpism in the Republican Party, but 10 years from now, um, because he's taking a leadership position and speaking out against Trumpism, people will be attracted to that uh, 
inevitably. And a decade from now, he will he will be a significant leader in the Republican Party. Whether and that speaks to the it takes a symbolic attitude to read culture, right? And and so. Um, and when people see what the consequences are of the attack on the Capitol, mm -hmm. you know, first of all, they have to say, what was that about? I mean, even if we had won, you know, the, the, um, the Republican base had won, what, would, what did they win? What would they have won? Okay, and, and uh, nobody knew. And if you don't have a leader that can art articulate what you win. Uh, okay, so what they wanted was for uh, Trump to be uh, the president for another four years or eight years or, you know, take take over the country. You know, there, uh, Gandhi had a great, great quote, which was, you know, there, there have been tyrants and for a time they can seem very powerful. But in the end, they always fail. Think of it, always. And, and so, um, you know, the tyranny that Donald Trump represented in, in terms of his treatment of uh, refugees at the border and that sort of thing, that, that, can't be, that can't last. People will not stand for that. Uh, well, and Gunnar even mentioned a great, a great statement slash question he used the word demonstration, I would change it to insurrection, but I'll, I'll quote him as at his word. But the woman who got shot at the demonstration January 6th was obsessed by odd ideology from the media. You can see a video of her on social media where she is driving to the protest and she is regurgitating the thoughts and ideas from news based in fear. Mm -hmm. Who would she be if not influenced by the media? Right. And, and so... Uh, they were being influenced by the media, but mm -hmm. look, but look what's happening now. Things have consequences. When you do things, they have consequences. And mm -hmm. so, so what has happened since January 6th, since two days ago? Um, Lou Dobbs, who had the most popular television program on Fox News, was fired. Boom, he's gone. Uh, because why? Because Fox News got sued for. 2.7 billion dollars okay? right and that's that's the only only the start of it okay because uh so many things like like that have happened which they got away with and that, time's up and time's up yeah your your 15 minutes of fame are over boy and and the consequences of having that four years, Donald Trump is going to be living that karma out for the rest of his life. No doubt. Yeah, they're having, they're having to cut the roses back too hard, you know, right. to, to buy them several years. Right. You know? And, 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 uh, and that is going to be paid down to the third or fourth generation and probably the fourth generation, because um, we look at, at uh, Baron Trump, my God, what is he facing in his lifetime? Okay, we, are, we already know, there are already news stories about how Ivanka and Jared are going to be shunned. Well, they're going to be shunned if they're not in jail. <laughs> we'll see. <laughs> but well, even the signs being, up in New York. Being shunned is the best that they can hope for. Right. Right. And, and, and exile so, is at least a place. I yeah. mean, Right. So Miles says here, um, the need for God and searching to fill the void, thinking a leader can fill God's shoes for them, perhaps. Yes, I agree with that. And, and, but anyway, they need a leader. Okay. And uh, for a time that was uh, uh, Donald Trump as a demigod, but, but uh that demigod is out of it. Okay. Well, it's so interesting that in terms of need a leader, I mean, D Donald Trump's not a leader. He is a magnet, but leaders, basically, if I look even at wolves, right. the alpha wolf is at the end of the pack. The beta wolf is at the front because it's the old quote, oh, look, my people are going. I must follow them. That I yes. think you, you put forward. Right. And 
there's that's a leader where there's a motivation aspect present rather than a blindly hooked on a carrot dragon forward kind of perspective right okay so we're going to so, go on with this essay next week um on page 35 of volume two and we are working with an essay by, by david tacy entitled uh, the return of the sacred in an age of terror and uh, this is volume two of Jung's Red Book for Our Time, Searching for Soul Under Postmodern Conditions, um, edited by Murray Stein and Thomas Arst. And we've been working with this essay um, by David Tacey. And uh, we will continue on with it next week. We, it, it, it's, uh, let's see. 13 pages to go. We got cool. through one, Not two. One. Uh, we got three. through three pages today or two and a half pages today. So that's actually quite a bit for us. <laughs> yeah. So we're, we're going to do that for the next few weeks. And then with luck, we'll do the other book that I mentioned. Um, but first, this, this one. Um, and so Max, how is B Ag going to take over? My community community garden. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Well, um, Max Joseph says uh, Fox claims they were firing Lou before the lawsuit. Well, I, I I suspect that you're going to see a lot of changes at Fox News in different ways for different kinds of pushes and pulls will be uh, emerging because. Um, you know, people who, you know, people were reticent about, well, first of all, we didn't have a justice department that was a real justice department for the last four years. And so people got away with stuff that uh, in normal times they cannot get away with. Yeah, the DOJ and, and the AG would be all over that, just saying they wouldn't even be in the door. Right. You know? And, and so, um, uh, you know, I, the GOP is dragging its feet on uh, confirming uh, Merrick Garland for attorney general. And I'm sure that they're scared because Merrick Garland <laughs> was, was about uh, before he was he uh, went to the bench. He was in the Justice Department and he was fighting the kind of uh, right. corruption and fraud that that uh, the people around Trump have uh, perpetrated for the last four years. And, um, and so it's, it's going to be an interesting time. The, the other shoe, we haven't even had the first shoelace drop yet. Um, mm -hmm. Or maybe Lou Dobbs is the first shoelace or Well, if intonation. you notice too, the pace slowed, <clears throat> which to me says thoughtful. Instead of just pushing things through, they get trampled down. It's like instead of flack and a Gatling gun, this is people are taking steps consciously that are going to stick. Absolutely. Um, so, yes, there is still a lot of resentment in the United mm -hmm. States. Yes. And that that resentment is uh, the dark side of God. And that dark side of God um, can be very destructive. And so I, I don't think that the, the quote unquote civil war is over, not by any means, but, um, but it's now begun. And we know that, you know, Fort Sumter has been fired upon. So, <laughs> so to speak, right. Yeah. Yeah. But it's not going to be the kind of civil war that, that happened in the 19th century. It will be, it will be, a war for the hearts and minds of Americans. And uh, well, and there's also an argument there about civilization itself returning to the city, going away from nature. Civilization in that regard, where nature is so removed, creates uncivilized behavior over time. Yes. Because you have a disconnection from what right. is actually making you up. Right. Um, and, and that, that's, we've seen the culmination of that. Right. Um, but, 
you know, I know that I know that Ted Cruz and Josh Hawley are Donald Trump wannabes, but nobody's going to follow them the way Donald Trump was followed. And um, well, that's the thing. They were alleged leaders who followed. So they weren't henchmen. They weren't uh, right hand men, women, what have you. I mean, they, they weren't up there in a way. In a sense, they were looking up to daddy. You know? yeah, I mean, they're, they're only trying to garner the, the so-called base, but right. that base is already in the process of breaking up in, in many ways. And, and it shows some spinelessness, you know, that, that oh, they're just going to go with what's popular. Well, but, you know, what's popular, if, if yeah. you're liked by everybody, you have a serious problem. <laughs> yeah. So anyway, it's going to be an interesting time going forward. Sure is. So, uh, Gunnar, you've been in the shadow all, all morning today. Uh, how are you doing? Any? Do you have any final comments before we... Uh... Well, maybe just a reflection on typology. What yeah, you okay. Think. Uh, that if you look at culture and actual politics and religion and social movements are created by the psyche, as you said before, and a particular typoli typology that expresses itself through the members of each particular social, ethnic, and religious collective groups. Mm -hmm. So I was wondering if, if there could be a harmonizing agent between those different typology groups a bridge between the two disparate typologies. Well, it's because clear that we have a lot of work to do, okay, um, on, on typology of the collective unconscious. Uh, Dr. Young very frequently commented on the fact that Americans are so ext extroverted and um, I, I, for the longest time, I couldn't figure out what he was talking about because I know I'm hugely introverted and, uh, you know, I don't, I'm not like Donald Trump wanting to build up a band. And so I, I didn't know what he meant, but what he mean, meant was that Americans are very much into materialism. And it's so, superficial. yeah, yeah, it's superficial. And so it's, um, it's keeping up with the Joneses. It's, it's uh, out in my parking lot outside my building here. Uh, we have a lot of uh, Mercedes and Lexus and BMWs in that lot. And, um, you know, that's meaningful to a lot of, you know, upper middle class Americans that that they have a have a high end car in the parking lot, okay, and and that they have a bigger high end car than others, um, and um, you know. But I for a long while I had a twenty one year old car <laughs> until until my wife hit some debris on the road and took the bottom out from under it. But uh, but I had this. Um, car that was 21 years old and geez it, it worked just fine getting me to and from everything I had to do and we still have one that's uh, 17 years old and and so I I don't um, I don't consider my essence uh, what kind of car I drive okay and mm -hmm. I, I never put a uh, bumper, I normally, I don't put a bumper sticker, any stickers on my car that indicate anything about my politics. Um, and if anything, uh, because I have a red Prius, people might think my politics are opposite from what they are. <laughs> <laughs> you get this sporty color with, I love that for a Prius. <laughs> That's <Right>. funny. <laughs> um, <laughs> My stepmother did that. She's like, I love the fun button. You know, hit the right. sport button. So it's anyway. Yeah, but but Americans, um, well. They uh, like their big trucks. <laughs> yeah, we, we are Superficial, into, right. 
into superficial things. And I, I show this picture often, but I might as well show it today to, as a capstone here. Um, this is my community, which has a marina in it. And this yacht um, is a 64 foot motor yacht. And notice the name of this motor yacht is mm -hmm. never enough. Okay. And, and uh, I remember when I got a motor yacht, it was not a 64 footer, it was a 27 footer. But the first time my partner and I took it out into the Chesapeake Bay uh, and hit big waves, we said, we need a bigger boat. <laughs> and, <laughs> and, and so you notice that this, this material thing, this piece of uh, fiberglass is sitting there alone uh, with no people on it. There's no life in that motor yacht as there is no life in the BMWs and Lexuses that are in the, in the parking lot. And that's where Americans have uh, made our mistake. And so, but I do agree with Dr. Young that, you know, Amer the American collective is at the moment extroverted and wearing their heart on their sleeve type thing. <clears throat> and so also there, um, and, and so that means we're extroverted. We want to show our material well-being and we're into things. So that's sensing, not intuitive. We're not intuitive. And so the, the process of this YouTube channel for the last five years is to get people to reflect more on what their life is. Um, and if, if I may, um, Gunnar's, to, to speak directly to also to Gunnar's question, I mean, one, I think you're showing the empty boat, um, empty motor yacht um, is good. But then I'm wondering if na when the, those six words, nature is the magical agent. I wonder, Gunnar, if nature is that harmonizing agent you're you're questioning about because it feels like all these logos things are pretty they're superficial but you know i know when i'm on a trail i'll pick up rocks I, like that's a pretty rock i want that in my house so in a sense i steal some nature now i don't do that in hawaii for example you, you don't bring things back it's just kind of the myth but um but I'm wondering if nature is that harmonizing agent and that the inner yeah. nature, you know, and because I thought I appreciate Gunnar's question is, is there a harmonizing agent? And it may yeah. be as simple as nature. Um, I agree with you, uh, you know, because when I w just walk outside my building here and I go for a walk, all of a sudden I just feel an in intense sense of well being. Okay. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, it's a sense of well-being that I never felt when I was flying first class on airplanes. <laughs> right. And especially not when I was flying economy on airplanes. Yeah. <laughs> right? You have to stand up and that's it. So. Right. And so, um, so uh, yes, there is type. And, um, of course, we have everybody very rational now. So... So Americans are EST, and then um, you know the the J or the P is is um, you know some are judging and and think they have to go do something. Others uh, like me, I'm a P, so I don't feel I have to do anything. It's like uh, Dr. Young said, you know. I, I don't think it's my job to make sure that cherries grow, grow on stalks or cherry trees. You right. Know? Uh, and so I don't think it's my job to go out and politic for the things that I believe because, um, I, you know, I've lived all over the United States. I've lived all over the world. And um, I already know how people are. Um, and, uh, you know, the people that 
are that attack the Capitol, um, you know, I see why they erupted. Okay, I see why they're unhappy. And we have to fix those things that cause them to be unhappy. But I would say 99% of those people are really salt of the earth people. Okay. They're, they're really yeah, people right. that you would want to have in your home. And they've been left behind by society. And we need politicians who won't leave us behind. Okay. Mm -hmm. And, you know, for the last 40 years, the, the GOP has been dominated by very wealthy people by Wall Street, and so on, and even longer than that, uh, for the last century. And, and so we have to figure out who the enemy is. The enemy isn't our politicians, the enemy is people that would keep us down. Uh, and, uh, you know, that's, that's not, uh, that's not people of color, that's not, um, people, you know, middle class white people, that's, that's people who um, want to keep control of power, and want to keep control of the sources of money. So we saw a few of the sources, all of a sudden emerge at the end of the Trump administration, like Trump starts to sell um, pardons. Okay, so so he got a lot of money for that and he um and so they he was selling hatred too so he's selling hatred and he was getting millions and millions of dollars put in this uh, pack for himself at the end of his presidency which nobody is gonna um check how he spends the money so uh <clears throat> So, you know, those are inappropriate things to happen. But now that we know that and we see that, then we can elect politicians who aren't going to maintain the status quo for the 1%. Uh, and, and, oh, by the way, uh, the 1% actually went over the top because um, what they did in 2008 was they harvested uh, the life savings of my generation in the United States. And so lots of people like me who thought we had a, a nest egg set aside for, um, for retirement suddenly found ourselves um, basically living at, at the poverty level or close to it. And it's more like a 0 0.01 percent rather than one percent. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah. You and, move the decimal exactly. And, and so, so, and I can prove that the banks got paid double, or the financial industry, uh, not specifically banks necessarily, but the financial industry. Uh, got paid double on all default, defaulted mortgages after the 2008 crash. And, and so that meant that, you know, if I owed $500,000, they got a million. Uh, mm -hmm. and, uh, and the same sort of thing is happening in the pandemic where we've already approved something like $3 trillion in aid but the average American has gotten 600 bucks so far, or whatever it is, right? I guess we've gotten a little bit more than that now. Uh, but, you know, a couple thousand dollars per American, and if you, if you multiply that out by heads of ha household in this country, that's, that's chicken feed compared to the amount of money that has been approved and spent. So it's all going, it's all going up all that money has been going up. And so we have to get smart about it and figure out how we can keep some of it down in the, in the lower levels where the rest of us have to live. And the way to do that is not by attacking the capital. The way to do it is by getting smart about our politics and about how we explain things to people. And, um, 
And so, um, but the problem is they, they've gone too far because uh, all this extra money that they got in the last 12 years by these crises uh, is now just little green electrons sitting in Swiss banks. Well, those little green electrons can't do anything. They, they're not productive. And, and so now the 1% is having difficulty finding things to invest in. Okay, that's, what, that's what's currently happening. Um, and uh, so they're trying to figure out ways how, the, how they can make that money productive because it's actually, uh, you can't eat it, okay? <laughs> and and you, you can't drink oil, okay, and gas. And so you have to figure out a way to turn it into something that you like. And after, after you've built a palace with gold toilet seats or gold toilets, then what? Okay, <laughs> you, know, you get to a point of no, of no value return and still you have trillions of dollars and little green electrons and what, and so, they have a problem too, because they're now in the position that they have to figure out how to get the rest of us going again, because that's how they, that's how they get a return on that money. Yeah. They've got a problem with their timing belt, you know, the car's starting to stall. Right. And, and so, oh yeah, you can have a Mercedes in your garage and you can have a gated community, but, but, after a while, you get, you start start to get tired of your family, you know. And there's nothing happening, <clears throat> and so um, so you know that's what started to happen. We've we've gotten a, a stagnation going because uh, the people that do have power and wealth don't have things to invest in anymore, and, or not enough, and and so they need to get it get things balanced out too in order for them to get return uh, and at least that's my view and so um, and I think that that will happen inevitably so I, <laughs> in other words I'm a I'm a perceiving guy so I don't think it's my job to make that happen I, I can observe that it is going to happen whether they like it or not because that's the only way that they can uh, succeed and right. and you know in the French Revolution, um, when the aristocracy didn't take care of of the peasants, um, what ended up happening was they lost their heads. Okay, and and so they have to get this right and solve it, yeah. or. Um, or you're going to have more crises like we had on the sixth, right? And um, and they know it, they know it. And so the best thing the GOP could do right now is is impeach Donald Trump and and make him so he can't run for office again, because uh, that will be the best way to excise him from from the party other otherwise he's just going to drag he and his henchmen are just going to drag down uh that side of the of the society for 20 or 30 more years probably um and so if if the gop doesn't make a clean break from him now then they're going to deserve what they get yeah no long goodbyes that's <laughs> <laughs> That's the way it should be. Yeah, anyway, don't need the uh, uh, And so, anyway, thanks for today. Yeah, and good idea about about thinking about the collective in terms of psychological type. I think that you're right on mm -hmm. about that. Thank and, you, Gunnar. And, and you know, it's it's simply thinking about these things that is going to make the difference gradually. Okay, we have. Uh, 14 people live following this live stream right now on on YouTube and each one of us 
that's involved in this conversation, whether actively or passively, um, is introverting. We're all uh, thinking about these issues and what needs to be done about them. And, um, and so that's a start, okay? It's a start toward introverting America so that we start to realize that the, the material ism that was sold to us in the 20th, 20th century hasn't made us happy. By the way, I mean, <clears throat> you, you just have to look at Donald Trump who's the poster boy for materialism, right? He's a guy that got everything in his lifetime, a lot of it handed to him because of who he was born, how he was born. He was born with a silver spoon in his mouth and he always had it. And, and so he's the poster boy for materialism. But I ask you the question, is this man happy? Okay, and I don't think there's anybody that can convince me that Donald Trump is happy and living at loves his eco highs. Pretty much. Pardon? He probably loves his eco highs where he gets from the public. Mm -hmm. And when we're describing types, we are just basically describing abstract patterns of consciousness. Right. Would you say Joe Biden is an introvert or? I'm sorry, I didn't understand your point. Would you say uh, Joe Biden, your current president, is he an introvert? <laughs> is is he what is an he introvert. An introvert introvert oh he's surely an introvert i think he's definitely an introvert um and uh but you know the point is things can't in the end make you happy even if you get everything you could possibly think of and wish for which is which is what donald trump has managed to get in his lifetime but He's not happy. It's like the Midas touch, right? Yeah, the man with the Midas touch starves yeah. his soul, right? right. The old quote, right? And and so, uh, if you want to live a happy life, you have to find a different way than that, um, you know. Because at least before he was president, he had an airplane with his name on it. He had, you know, he has buildings with his name on it all over the world. You know, he's got any car he wants. He's, he's had three trophy wives. <laughs> he's been president of the United States. You know, what else could he aspire to? Um, there, there's really nothing else that he could aspire to. But, Maybe you could buy that never enough boat and just head out to sea. <laughs> yeah, but, but the reality is he will never be happy. And the people that have been around him will also never be happy. Um, for the rest of their lives, um, you know, down to the third generation, at least down to Baron Trump and probably down to Baron Trump's children, um, because um, they will never live down his performance in office, never. And, um, and so, you know, the happiness that they envisioned of dominating the United States and being gods. Uh, no, that isn't going to, that's not the way it's going to work. <laughs> and, and, you know, in my case, I have Cassandra's curse, which is um, I can predict the future, but nobody believes me. Uh, <laughs> but, but nonetheless, it normally proves to be true. And so, anyway, peace, gentlemen. Uh, All right. Jordan, I'll see you tomorrow night and onward. With the Sounds day. good. And good luck, good luck in the Super Bowl, whoever you're voting for. I'm voting no, for the commercials I, and for halftime. Yeah, me too. <laughs> <laughs> see you later. <laughs> Thank you, Gunnar. I, I barely know who's playing. So. <laughs> yeah, I, I realized yesterday I still didn't. So. <laughs> yeah. So, bye bye. Uh, uh, Miles, Miles says, might not convict him to protect the sovereign immunity of the office of the president. Uh, yeah, who knows? I mean, that would be wackadoodle. There has to be there has to have to be some bounds, I think.